yes, I get it now. It's like a vessel for, you know. It's like, it, it's, it, it's it comes like, down to hearts and minds. That's all it is. It's, it's a hearts and minds operation. And one rogue soldier can ruin a whole, whole operation. One soldier doing the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong place can have a detrimental effect on months and months and months of work. And that's, that happened. I was going to say, how are you, Tim? And I'm now I'm going to say, how are you, Colours? I'm great, thanks. Is that the same in the Army as it is in the Marines? We, we, we call our Colour Sergeants Colours, and that, that's an acceptable thing to call them? No, in the Army, it's called Colour. So colour. they don't put the S on the end. It's uh, quite funny okay. because I work with the, the Marines quite a bit. I, I did three deployments with three Commando Brigade. And they were all calling me colours. And uh, and when I moved into London, they all called me sir, uh, working with the guards. And then I had an opportunity to go back and work with my regiment and they called me colour. So it was, it was quite bizarre the way I was treated in the different regiments. So Tim, you sent me an email to introduce yourself and I was immediately fascinated because I don't think I've ever met anybody with such a vast experience, not just looking at the notes over here, folks. I'm not, not being rude to Tim. I've got them on my other screen, but such a vast amount of military experience. And of course, the, the one thing I'm getting asked a lot is, Chris, what about psychological warfare? How does it work? People ask me such terms as 77 Brigade and, um, and SRR and this sort of stuff. And the truth is, I, I, I have no idea. I mean, how, how, how could I? I, I'm, I didn't really know about that sort of thing when I served. <laughs> Closest thing I got to an intelligence officer was one of our Lance Corporals in Northern Ireland. He ran the, he ran our company's um, intelligence office. But I went to him once because I'd found the, the drogue chute, the, so the little black parachute that some IRA player or, or maybe their mother had very carefully stitched up. It was the parachute off the back of a, a drogue bomb. So a, a homemade, Mm. grenade they'd obviously lobbed it at a military vehicle um and the this parachute had ripped off and i found it when i was out on patrol so i took it to the intelligent our intelligence guy and i went i found this and he went mm. <laughs> <laughs> he threw it on the side and i'm like hang on what about forensics and you know <laughs> so I think you probably destroyed all of that yes <laughs> <laughs> it's got all his dna on it now and probably a bit i think mm. even i was careful enough to pick it up with a plastic bag or something <laughs> so tim let's just cover the intelligence groundwork so what who are these units what do they do how do they fit into the grand scheme of um, allied military? And then, of course, we're going to go back to the beginning and, and tell your, your, your story. OK. Um, to start with, 15 UK Psychological Operations Group set up in 1998 in Chicksands. The Intelligence Corps moved to the Chicksands um, in, I think it was about 97. Uh, and it was, it was a growing place they closed down Ashford, which was the Defence Intelligence School there, and they opened up at Chicksands after the Americans moved out. 
15 UK science group moved in and started recruiting. At that stage, it was eight regulars and they had places for 20 reserves. And that's where I ended up coming into it. I'll come into that in a bit. Mm. Also on Chicksands, there was, it was the Defence Intelligence and Security School where they trained all the intelligence staff. Uh, joint services, by the way, they, they had Navy and RF there. They all started to move in and do their basic courses. Also on there was up at um, Building 600 was DHU, which is the Defence Intelligence or Defence Human School. And then they had the other schools there. They had S branch, R branch, I branch, which is reconnaissance, surveillance and interrogation. So all those schools were based in one place. In 1998, or was it? Yeah, 1998, the, there was a big recruiting day in, uh, across the country for reserves. And the guys from 15 Science Group came to the TA centre that I was in in Bedford. I wasn't actually there that particular day, but... Uh, the guys knew what I was up to and they asked me if, um, if I'd like to give them a call. So I gave the squadron leader a call. He asked me to come down to Chicksands, went across to Chicksands, had an interview, and I had a, the sort of the skill set that they were looking for. So um, a few, I think it took about a month, month later, six weeks later, I transferred from the TA unit I was in across to 15 Psyops group. So, Tim, just to clarify, what was the unit that, that you were in? I was with 36 Signal Regiment at the ah, time. Okay, so you were a signaler, so you had a bit of background in communications, and you've now yeah. you've now been recruited by this 15 UK um, psychological operations group. Psychological operations, and. What what's their mandate then? What's the what 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 do they basically do? Well, the reason they took me on is is I have a, a a bit of a background in print. My wife used to work for a printers in Milton Keynes, and occasionally I'd go along um, when they were really busy, and I used to mind a machine. They had a a single color press Heidelberg. They need to run for 24 hours. And I would go in and mind one of the machines, which was, um, which is where I learned the print trade. Print is one of the medias that psychological operations use. I was also a driver. I had um, my class one heavy goods license, and I could also drive a class one bus or a D plus E is now. So I can drive a, a, a coach with a trailer on it. So that was one of the reasons that they took me on. What's the what's the link then with the printing and the methods that they use? Is this sort of some dissemination of propaganda or something? Absolutely. Um, so psychological operations basically is um, planned operations to a commander's mission to affect a change in attitudes of behavior of a Pacific target audience. And that's all psychological operations is. Mm. I, I like to think it as propaganda, lies and deception. And the way we go about doing that is using all the available media to hand. So there's print, radio, TV, mobile phones, any way that you can communicate is a way of putting across a message to affect a change in attitude and behavior of a target audience. Yes, and of course, in modern day, we're talking social media, aren't we? And Facebook and infiltrating. Yeah. You've always got that obnoxious person that pops up on your Facebook and starts calling you names like conspiracy theorist. And you're like, yeah, hang on, mate. I have no idea. I, you're just a fake profile as far as I'm concerned. What, wh who's paying you to put, I've, I've seen it done, you know, I saw it done after the Las Vegas shooting. Um, 
you know, these 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 catastrophic events that crop up. And yes, so these people that are against this um, this program, are you saying they're being subjected to a possibly being subjected to a campaign of disinformation or, or um, discrediting? Oh, absolutely. It goes on all the time against everything, pretty much. I mean, you look at, uh, for, for instance, Brexit, the, the Ramon and the Brexiteer side, and they were at each other's throats all the way through the whole thing. I mean, the, the part of the government spent the last four years trying to get, not come out of Brexit. Um, and they just made it really difficult for those that, that voted for it. And the vast amount of, or 52% of the country voted for it. Mm. Um, so there was, yeah, that, that, that campaign of, of they're, not, yeah. They're so very they, good at putting sound bites in people's ears that they just then repeat as a, yeah. almost like a mantra. So, yeah. for example, with the medical issue that we were, we mentioned earlier, they're very, they love to blame it on this rogue doctor that wrote this, uh, you know, illegal paper, yeah. you know, this paper of nonsense. And when you look into that story, you realize it wasn't some one rogue, you know, poor guy is actually yeah. a freaking legend. The guys, are, but of course, Joe Public, they hear that, oh, that was just one doctor. And then they just repeat, yeah. repeat, repeat um, with the Brexit. It's very much the, um, you know, blame it on the thick, the thickos in the class system who yeah. don't, who don't understand the benefits of Europe. Whereas those of us that, that, you know, we want an independent land, wonderful country that England is. It's one of the most amazing places to live on the planet. Why should it not be independent? Right. Yeah. Um, Though that that kind of view gets made to look like they're all kind of country bumpkins or 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 sun sun readers. <laughs> yeah, you see <laughs> guardian mean, you, readers. You you see the trends. You see them put this info. Yeah, you know, and and every everything that they said that there was going to be the doom and gloom just hasn't happened. Mm. The in, in fact the opposite. The 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 amount of. Uh, trade deals that we're getting at the moment. Liz Trust is doing a magnificent job of, of going around the world and, and securing these massive, massive trade deals with the rest of the world, which we should have been doing in the first place. Yeah, it, the, we're getting a little bit off to one side, but the, the notion yeah. that, that England will fail and no one will want to trade with us just completely goes against what trade is. Trade will find the way. If Absolutely. there's a penny to be made, it will find the way. It's just the way, you know, it's... But, so, let's just, um, before we dig deeper into this, so, we've got, um, this was 15 UK psychological group. Yep. Or psychological warfare group. Operations group. Operations group. We've got 77 Brigade. What What's the difference between these two? Okay, 77 Brigade was set up um, just a few years ago. They all it, it amalgamated um, media operations and um, MMST, which is the Military Stabilisation Force. So sort of the engineers and everything that go out looking at projects. And they swallowed those three units into one unit and called it 77 Brigade because it was all to do with media and uh, people, basically. So it's, it's just a way of bringing that together under one umbrella to be able to push out the same sort of narrative. I'm not sure it, it, it works particularly well. I've, I've not actually seen too much of it because I moved away from the unit um, in 2009, so I missed out on that that era of moving into 77 Brigade. But I have been back there on a couple of occasions for meetings to see people. Um, we we have a, 
an association, 15 Sharks Group Association, that tries to instill some of our knowledge on people today. But the nature of the, the, the military is that you get a new broom comes in and, and wants to make their own mark and, and then goes about reinventing the wheel rather than looking back at lessons learned. Yes. So, and, and we're saying that SRR is more your kind of spy handling or agent handling? No, uh, DHU. It, it, DHU are the, the agent handlers. SRR are more um, intelligence gatherers. Okay. And how would they gather that intelligence? Through a network of, of, of um, assets or...? Yeah, I think so. I'm not 100 sure how they actually operate. I know that they we've used them in the past for 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 getting information that we need on target audiences, and and they feed that back in. Um, when we were in Afghanistan, there was a what they call the X group that bring together all the intelligence and then look at disseminating it across the the workpiece, as it were. Um, mm. And we would feed in questions that we needed answering about a certain target audience that we're looking at. And the agent handlers, the DHU types would be out on the ground. SRR would be out on the ground. The MSST would be on the ground. So all the different agencies are out there. Can, we, um, can we just, can we just um, explain those acronyms, Tim? Because I don't even know what... So what does... What does SRR actually mean, do we know? That's the Special Recce Regiment. Special Recce Regiment. You, you, did you say D, DSU? DH, DHU. DHU. Defense, yeah, Defence Human Unit. Um, and they're based at Chicksands. Okay. And you did mention another one there, and I, I haven't got the memory oh, to remember what you said. The X Group. X group. Oh, the MSST. Oh, MSST. Yeah, Military Stabilization Security Force. Or, or team. Yeah, team. And, yeah. and that, that, they're small teams made up of generally um, engineer type people that work with local authorities in, in areas to provide assistance, basically. To, to rebuild schools, to put in irrigation systems, that type of thing. Uh, and, and those guys are, are, are really good on the ground. They, they work out of small um, forward operating bases, small patrol bases, and they work in a Pacific, a small area, and they get to know the locals and particularly well. And they were a great source for us to tap into in, uh, in the last stages or in around about 2006, seven, in Afghanistan, we introduced a, a thing called, we called radio in a box. And it was a, a radio transmitter, FM radio transmitter in a box uh, that we used to be able to play music on and put messages out on. And we used to use the MSST teams to run these for us. They would have a, their own interpreters and they would be on the ground they were getting ideas of, of what people wanted to listen to and they were able to push out messages. So that's the way that we operated that. And one of my, my, um, my roles, particularly in my last deployment in 2008-9 with 3 Commando Brigade, I spent six months bouncing around Helmand from Kajaki in the north to Garmasir in the south to Sangin, um, installing the radio in a box network, basically training up the guys how to operate it, training up the interpreters to be able to be presenters. Um, and we had a really, really great success down in Garmasia. Um, it was it was in, in the most southern area of of Helmand that we were operating in, and they managed to push out the. Um, the safe zone from San, uh, from Garmasia, and we were using the radio in the box to be able to project messages. And we, I trained these guys up, and we went live to air this particular day. We, 
Our two guys are really good as presenters. We put together a program. They played some music. They were putting out some messages. They were chatting like smashy and nicely. They were chatting away to each other. Uh, and we, we did that for two hours in the morning. And then we have a shutdown during the day because people don't listen to the radio during the day. And then they start listening again in their sort of what we call the drive time show. Well, during the day, um, we had several people approach the camp with bits of paper asking to have a mention on the radio and play a particular tune that they were listening to. On day one, we have four notes come in asking. So we, we put this on the afternoon show. So we mentioned these guys on the afternoon show. We played their song for them and we put out that bit of news and stuff like that. And, and, and that, that afternoon show went out for, I think it was about two hours again. So the following day, we got a stack of um, requests coming. People just coming up to the camp, bits of paper, radio, radio. And um, so we, we, we've been going for about two or three days like this. And I said, wouldn't it be a good idea if we slipped in a couple of messages from girls? Because all the messages we've been getting so far were for boys um, asking for a tune for their mates and stuff like that. So I said, what about if we put a couple in for girls? So we, we, we mentioned a couple of girls' names for their friends. Well, that afternoon we had, I, I, don't, I, I think it was about 10 or 15 bits of paper come in, requests from girls. This, this had taken off like a, a skyrocket. So we didn't need to do any more other than read these messages out. We've got a listenership then. So we had a good idea of how many people were actually listening to that particular radio station. And then we were very able to, to feed in the messages that we wanted to get across about reporting um, activities of the, the Taliban and stuff like that. And we were getting little messages back in about this going on in this area. And it was, we fed it all in to the chain and it was going up and the directors of operations were able to target Pacific areas where this illegal activities was going on. So that was one of the great successes that we had uh, at that time. Are we, to clarify, Tim, are we saying that the this radio station was a was a cover operation and, and this mess these me these kind of messages was a cover operation for actually putting your own messages out there or or for understanding what was going on on the the, the, the it it from what you said it sounds like you just started a radio station and i'm wondering what was the what was the point of it uh, it was just to, to get our message out because in Afghanistan it's really do you mean, difficult. Do you mean like the Western message, like you know, girls can have beards and guys can go to school and all that sort of stuff? Mm, no, not quite. Um, we weren't pushing it that hard. It was basically just a way of getting the commander's message out to people on the ground to to you know, I mean to to turn in the Taliban basically. Ah, oh, okay. because 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 the general population because it was so unsafe for guys to go out on the ground. I mean, I went out four times. On, actually, I had to, had to go out on a patrol four times in two thousand nine. On two of those occasions, people died. They were blown up, hmm. and, and that's that's the difficulty of being able to get out to see the target audience. Again, in 2006, 2005, 6, I was, I was again in Helmand. Um, one of my main roles at that time was producing radio messages. And we came up with a, um, we were going to do a radio series. We we're going to call it the Afghan Archers. So it was a bit like the Archers. So it was about rural people. It was about trying to get that message out of reporting stuff and to keep it fairly current we were using what was actually happening on the ground where um for instance we, we there was a bomb went off in Lashkagar market 
and the following week I had uh, the, the program was about reporting what had gone on, what people had seen. So we had a couple of the guys talking about um, about what they should do. Um, is it safe to go to the market still because of the, the threat of, of this, this, this being bombed again? So we had a couple of guys coming down in a, in a, in a truck from Garmacia with their goods, wondering whether they're going to be able to go home again at the end of the day without being blown up. From that message going out that, that following week, we had several informants um, pointing the finger at certain people. So that, that, that's the sort of success that we were having at that time. And my greatest, greatest coup of the whole Afghan archers, I managed, I've been working on it for a few months. And just down the road from Lascagar camp, there was the, the women's centre. Um, we'd, we'd been getting in there, or the, the, the MSST team had been getting in there for quite some time. And I wanted to do uh, an episode with women in the home talking about stuff that had been going on. And we finally managed to get, um, I think it was about six women come in. And, and it was a massive little operation. I say massive little operation. We, we got these six women in, in a van, all the, the covered over, bringing them into the into the into Lascagar compound. The MSST had a, a quiet room where nobody else had access to. We managed to get them in there. We sat them down and we, we I was in there for about, about four and a half hours to record a 10 minute episode. And we went through this and we recorded this episode and it went out and it it we got massive, massive feedback from it. And I did a second one a couple of weeks later. And then unfortunately, I left Afghanistan. My tour was over. But one of the women that we had come in, she was, I think, something like a minister. But I'd seen her up in Kabul in 2002. Uh, the lawyer, Jerga, she got up on the stage and she was able to speak uh, and, and say about, asking for women's rights at the lawyer Jirga in in Afghanistan mm. and I mean, the bravest woman I've ever seen and and and, and I remembered her from, from from Kabul and she kind of remembers me see, seeing me there because I had a, a brief conversation with her while while she was waiting to go up on the stage so you you actually started a, like a radio soap opera and it was yeah. the Afghan version of the archers. So I'm guessing it's like, there's trouble at, at compounds, bloody IED's gone off. Oh, I, <laughs> sorry, you, you can probably yeah. gather I, I yeah. detest the BBC. So, and, and, and even when I, was brainwashed enough to listen to the BBC. I hated the archers. I absolutely, I used to think, why are you <laughs> stealing my license fee for this utter just, ah, sorry, gone off on one there, as you can probably tell. I don't like well, the archers, but <laughs> this sounds, <laughs> this sounds amazing. You, you. I, you it, it, it. Yeah. I mean, I, I had some, the first, the first one that we put out, we put the script together, and um, and it, we got it approved, and we got it translated, and it didn't translate too well. Um, so what I decided to do is to get the the interpreters to write the script for me in in Pashto. So these guys, they sat down. We told them what we wanted to put into it they wrote it transferred it back into English which didn't make too much sense but you could get the gist of what it was doing so I put this script into to be approved because it everything that we put out has to go through an approval process it has to go to um, the legal department the political department 
before it gets to the commander. Uh, and at the, at the end of the day, the commander's the one that says yes or no. So I put this script in. And within 10 minutes, I got a phone call saying, can I go to the commander's office? <laughs> so I offered it down to the commander's office. And he said, what is this gobbledygook you've written here? So I explained exactly the way that the process worked, that, that we got, we gave the, the interpreters the brief, they wrote the script, they translated it back into English. That doesn't make a huge amount of sense, but it does in Pashto. So all we're getting them to do is, is to say yes to the, the concept of what that particular episode was about, which I did. He got it and it, that's the way we did it from then on. The, the, the Turks would write the script or we would, we would give them a brief. They would write the script. We get it approved. Then they would record it. And that's, that's the way we went on. And, and the messages that we were putting out were on the same milk. So we got what we wanted to achieve done. I'm feeling sorry for these poor Afghanis because people believe that when they watch a soap opera here that it's real. <laughs> <laughs> having this well, thrust upon, having the archers thrust upon them for the first time. Um, did Was there any um, big kind of like intelligence successes through through running this this show what 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 was you know was there a particular kind of aim was... yeah the, the main aim of it was to for for to get the local people to report on on illegal activities basically okay and yes we were getting some success you have to understand that people that live in in the local area are susceptible to intimidation by the Taliban. They've been living under their regime for an awful long time and to be seen, to be um, colluding with the, the, the Allied forces would mean almost certain death. It was, it, 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 it's that simple. And to get their trust, to get them on side, to get them to be reporting these guys um, was a difficulty. Uh, and that's 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 the reality of it and anything that we could do any little snippets of information that we could gain through what we were doing helped yes i get it now it's like a vessel for you know so it, it's, it, it's it comes like... down to hearts and minds that's all it is it's it's a hearts and minds operation and one rogue soldier can ruin a whole, whole operation. One soldier doing the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong place can have a detrimental effect on months and months and months of work. And that's that happened to me. I'd been you working mean, on a. Do you mean an allied soldier or a? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll give you a, a for instance. I was working on a project in. In Macedonia, we were doing the task force harvest. I, I don't know whether you remember it. It was the weapons collection off the uh, National Liberation Army of, Afghan of, of Albania. I've been working on this, this, this little project for ages, and I just got it to the stage where this, this particular village were happy to sort of talk to us and stuff like that. And then the Paris came in. And the two months that I'd spent on this village gaining their trust and stuff had gone in a day. They went in there using their um, brute force and ignorance and <laughs> lost all credibility. And um, unfortunately, we lost the intelligence that we were getting out of that village. Yes, you're, I'm get, getting images coming back of Belfast when I think in the four and a half months we were on tour there, we fired, I think it 
think three three baton rounds. Maybe there was a threat to fire more, but n- n- not a lot. I'm um, I'm talking outside of riots and stuff. Obviously, mm. um, the Paras joined us for a day. They'd fired three yeah. bat. They'd fired three baton rounds by the time they and they were still in in sight of the camp. <laughs> So they hadn't even left the road outside the camp and three they'd fired three three baton rounds at the uh you know at civilians. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, I, I I get it. I get it. Wow. Okay, let's let's if we may, Tim, go back and j- just just talk about your story and, and some um you know anything that um any dits you've got to spin, really? So you joined the Royal Ang- Anglian Regiment in 1974. What what made you? Yeah. Well, I started life out as um, a sea cadet when I was sort of 12. Um, I wasn't old enough to join the Army Cadets at the time. Um, and then when I got to 13, I joined the Army Cadets, and all I wanted to do was was be in the Army, basically. Applied to join the army, went down to Cosham, did the courses, did the selection down there, and I got a place as a junior soldier in the Royal Anglia Regiment. And on the 5th of August 1974, I turned up at a depot of the Queen's Division at Bassingbourne Barracks and did my training there. My first posting was to Munster in Germany, and I, I was in Munster for almost a year before we moved back to Gillingham. In Gillingham, we we were barely in Gillingham, actually. We, we were on exercise or away on operations more than we were in Gillingham. Then we went to Berlin. Berlin at that time was the best posting ever. Um, everybody enjoyed Berlin. We were there for just over, just over two years. And then some bright spark decides that um, our next posting would be Londonderry. So we go from the fantastic city of Berlin to Londonderry. So two years in Londonderry wasn't a lot of fun. It cost me a marriage. Um, and at the end of it, I I was posted, the, the battalion was coming back to Colchester and I was being posted to Sandybridge as a, as a driver clerk, storeman, basically. Uh, for the Army Hang Gliding Centre. Right, let, we're going to come on to that, Tim, but I want to hear about um, Derry, because that's, you know, not sure the right expression, but that's an iconic name in, in, in the history of mm. the history of the Troubles, isn't it? A very staunch IRA stronghold or Republican, um, Republican area. Mm. You, you said you were there for two years, so... Yeah, prior to that, in 77, I was in Belfast, and that was that was a really fruity tour for us. It was really busy. We A company was in the Bally Murphy, and at that time in the Bally Murphy was a real bed of discontent. We couldn't go out on the streets without um, without some sort of incident going on. I think in in the, in the four months that we were there, we had some sort of major type of incident every day in our area. We had shootings, rocket attacks. Um, we had one rocket attack just up from the camp. There was a post office van that used to get escorted by two Saracens. And on his way up to Kelly's Corner post office, which is just at the top of the road, they fired a, um, an RPG out of the ball ring, uh, which is which is in the centre of the Bally Murphy, across the Springfield Road, missed the van, missed the two Saracens, but hit this house. The, 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 the front wall of this house collapsed, bringing down a guy that was working on nights who was in his bed and he ended up in his front garden. It's quite funny, but um, it that was one of the, the major incidents. We had lots and lots of riots um, going on. Lots of people. Did you, lose, did you lose anybody? Yeah, we did. We lost a couple of guys on that. 
we had, um, I think, you know, Royal Scots came in our area to help us out. I mean, we, we were on our chin straps. We were working 18 hour days, practically every day, in and out like yo yo's. The only time you got a, a little bit of downtime was when you were on Sangers. Um, these guys went out on a patrol and they were, um, and they got hit with an IED uh, and it killed one of them. Mm. We were on another patrol for two months. We, we, all, all, all during the training, we were out in four-man bricks uh, and we go out on a patrol of 12, generally. My four-man brick, I was at, for two months, but when we were in training, we, we, we trained, and we come around the corner and say change, we swap sides. Two months we've been out there, we hadn't done that at all. I travel at the front right. The section commander was on the front left. I had a guy called Chris behind me and he had a guy called Terry behind him. We come down out of the Moyard into Spring Hill Avenue and we hadn't gone more than, I don't know, 100 metres down this, this road and we were fired upon. But just prior to that, as we came around the top corner, uh, Alan said, change. So we swapped sides. He's now on the right and I'm on the left. We got opened up on. First round went straight through his groin and out of his backside. The second round went through somebody's kitchen. I fired two rounds back. My second round took out a stained glass window of the church. Within, within a couple of minutes, the, the street started to fill up with people. I mean, there was just the four of us. Alan put out the, the contact report. He said, hello, one, this is one, three, bravo. Contact Spring Hill Avenue. Send Starlight. I've been shot in the arse. Out. <laughs> Within four minutes, uh, the, the Saracen ambulance had turned up um, and then the first patrols got to us. But it was a real, real scary, scary few minutes with the street filling up with people. On the follow-up, we, we initially followed up the wrong direction because he, we thought he got shot in the arse, and in fact, he got shot in the groin. Um, it didn't leave much of a, uh, an exit wound, which was, which was quite funny. But on the follow-up, we found the, the weapon, and it was a, an M1 carbine, and it was um, situated um, between the... There's a, a block of flats, a small gap, and the church and it was it was just behind the wall there and just behind that was a field so what we think happened was when my first round went down must have whizzed past his ear um, because he dropped the weapon um, yeah m1 carbine can you explain what what rifle is that uh, it's an american made um 5.56 I mean, is that like that? It's it's is that the same as the armor light? Is yeah, it's it's a predecessor to the armor light. It's it's the older version of it, I guess. Yeah, so they had them in Vietnam, didn't they? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got you. They also had them in Belfast. <laughs> yeah, well, we we got sniped at in the Ardoin. I say sniped because the guy was in a hide. They taken a they taken um the occupants of the house hostage earlier in the day. They always say taking them hostage. I think when the Didn't IRA, really. when the IRA yeah. knocks on your door and says, we're going to shoot some Brits from your back window, you go, okay, up the stairs. Do you want a cup of tea? Right. <laughs> but then they have to say that they were taken hostage. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is the Ardoin. It's a hardened Republican area. You don't live in the Ardoin unless no. you support the cause. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so the guys up there in the back bedroom sniped at us as we were moving across open ground. Um, hit George uh, Jock behind me three times <laughs> and turned out to be a Kalashnikov firing mm -hmm. a 7.62 short, short round. Um, reason I mention it is obviously it's not a, not a sniper rifle, I guess. I guess Somebody was, pretty good that's fired that then. Yeah, it was from quite a distance as well. It was at least, oh, 
I say quite a distance. We're talking about hundred meters from the firing point to where we were, approximately. Um, yeah, that was one hell of a day. I don't don't think I'll ever be forgetting that one. <laughs> well, not till not till the dementia kick, the dementia kicks in. But uh, yeah, just you talking a, a, um, about it, Tim, is just bringing back those the memories and the, and the sensation, the feeling of being on patrol in Belfast. You know, I can that... only apologise for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, for friends, listen, you probably heard the story before, but Jock, Jock lived, fortunately. Um, and I'm, all, all I can say is Belfast was just full on action from start to end. I was 19 years old. Um, it's just brilliant. <sighs> probably, I'm probably not supposed to say that, but it just, it was just what one hell of an experience. And this is the problem, isn't it, about war? Mm. I think the um, Sebastian, is it Sebastian Junger who wrote the, um, he, he made the film, um, was it Restrepo? He, he, he's a journalist famous for writing the book, The Perfect Storm, which later became a film. And then one of his other projects was he embedded with a US Marine unit, at an outpost in Afghanistan called Restrepo, I believe it was called. Um, I think that was a reference to a Marine who'd been shot dead there. And at the end of it, when he did his TED talk, he said, you know, these guys, even though they're in the hell, it's dirty. It's, you know, you, 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 you limited drinking water. You, you wash once a month, uh, you, your friends getting killed left, right and center. He said, these guys, when they get back to Civvy Street, all they want to do is go back to war again. Um, yeah, it's a difficult thing, isn't it? And he said, until we can answer that question, why is that? What? Why is that? Then, then we're going to keep having, probably going to keep having wars. Um, well, I think it's just the old boy's own adventure, isn't it? I mean, during the um, during the Afghan campaign, particularly, recruiting was really good. Once we pulled out of Afghanistan and we were not on operational tours, recruiting is pretty tough at the moment, I guess. Uh, and, and that's the reason boys want to go to war. They, they want to go and have their own adventures. Yes. Yes. And it's a whole nother. Yeah. Hmm. Again, I'm not sure the right word, but it's a whole nother thing again. Um, I think it helped because I was 19. I didn't really, I wasn't very politically aware. I didn't know any history. I, 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 I think we just genuinely believed we were doing the right thing, that we were the, the, the cliche good guys. And, and that meant every time when you hit the street, you, you just gave a hundred percent. Right. Yeah. Um, if I was in, uh, let's just say other conflicts, where the motivation for war was um, based on based on lies. If I was if I was mature enough to realise that, which I probably wouldn't be if I was a serviceman, because you you're quite indoctrinated. Um, I think that would be very that would put a very different angle on it, you know, running out those mm -hmm. gates knowing that I'm actually not doing anything for the security of the planet. I'm just making some sociopaths even more powerful than they than they already are um yes should we talk about that, some sorry yeah. tim um yeah london derry was was uh when we were there 80 to 82 um so it was a reasonably busy time i mean we was we was based in ebrington barracks um, so we was on the, the other side of the river from the bog side and all that. And it was just day-to-day -day patrolling. 
no real big incidents kicked off or anything like that that we had up there. It was it was people just getting on. I mean, they call it the Emerald Isle for a reason because it bloody rains most of the time. It was horrible up there. It wasn't my favourite posting, I must admit. Were you was your barracks based in a in a Protestant area if you were there for two years? Yeah, um, we actually lived on the the water side, which is the the, the I, I guess the north side of the the foil, and so the south side was the that had the bog side, the Craigan and all of that, and then we used to have Straban as well uh, down at the border. Um, but it's a it, it was it was just general low level stuff most of the time. Did you did you get to go out of the barracks? I mean, socialising this kind of thing. Yeah, there was you could you could go up to places like Limon Vadi. Um, what was the other place where the drop in well in was? Um, Ballymena. That so you could move around a little bit, but no, we generally didn't bother. We had a we had for those that lived. I lived in Nelson Drive, which was just up from from Ebrington Barracks. So it was, it was about half a mile walking to, to, to work every morning or so. So it wasn't too bad. Um, and we used to have a club in the, in, the, in the camp that we could go and have a drink if we wanted to, but generally you didn't. I mean, it was just getting on with life. Yes. Um, yeah. We were going to talk to him, weren't we, about... Sorry, I'm just trying to think if there's, there's um, a question I'm going to kick myself for not asking you afterwards. Were there any any serious incidents while you were in Derry? You said it was quite low-level stuff. Yeah, no, no, nothing big. Um, London Derry, was, so it was it was just... Uh, it wasn't, I wouldn't say benign... Um, you, you just needed to do your normal checks, but we didn't have, as far as I can remember, any major incidents that went off at that time. Certainly nothing to write home about. Um, yeah, not uh, from 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 what it was in Belfast in seventy seven to um, London Derry in eighty two. Uh, there was there was there was a world of difference. Yes, I bet. Yeah, so let's chat about, you mentioned hang gliding. Every time I think of hang gliding, I think of that Only Fools and Horses episode where Dale Boy gave it a go and he, he, he didn't, you know, he didn't land for 20 miles or something. <laughs> Ended up in a pylon. Oh, one second. Yep. Yep. Sorry, folks. We were just on pause. Pause. Pa our volume was paused then. Yeah. So I think I think of Dale Boy. Yeah, I know the guy that actually um, did the stunt for him. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember his name. It's a long time ago. So how did but, you um, so, how did you wangle that number? Um, it it was it was it was one of those things that. My, my marriage had broken down um, halfway through London Derry tour, and this posting just happened to come up. The adjutant called me in and said, "Did I want this posting?" Um, he said, "I said yeah." So I, I ended up travelling to Wales when in the October of '82. Arrived there, met a guy called Jim Taggart, who was the captain. He was a uh, Remy. He'd set this, or, or was he an engineer? Anyway, he'd set this thing up and they needed a, a driver, Clark Storman, to run the accommodation side, to do all the sending out, the joining instructions and, and general admin. And I kind of fitted the bill. I hadn't been there a, a week and he put me on the course. So I went and did the, the, the basic hang gliding course 
took like took to it like a, a duck to the air. <laughs> um, I managed to get out flying as as often as I could, uh, and within within the year, I was on a, a course to do my instructor's course, and I became. I, a, that I, I need to. We need to peel back here a bit. I, I want to know what's it like. The I mean, do you go up with an? Inst is it like you do a tandem first? No, no. What happens is um, you start off on kind of almost level ground. We, we used to go to a, a little place called Sahawi, which is in the, just outside of Merthyr, um, to a, a, a little slope that we used to use. And used to start people on the ground just to get the feel of what the hang glider is. Uh, and then you slowly move further and further up this slope and until you get your feet off the ground. And then you saw coming down from about 100 metres and controlling the glider. And, and stop at the bottom. Is there any danger that a, that a thermal or a gust of wind picks you up and before um, you know it, you're at a, a, a thousand feet or something? Not not in those early stages, no. You might get hit with a gust and, and occasionally, um, but certainly not thermal. You don't go out and train on those sort of days. You're just trying to try and find the, the, the reasonably, reasonably still air with it all, the wind in the right sort of direction coming up the hill, just to give you that added little bit of lift so you don't have to run quite so hard. Um, and, and, and over the course of the week, you, you're able to move further up the slope, get a bit more control over it. Um, and the final, the final test to get your pilot's license is we used to take them to Mirtha and, and throw them off of 900 feet and you fly down in controlled turns down to the landing field and I guess about 90% 90, 90 people could manage that by the end of the week. The hang gliders that we use were highway stubbies which are very controllable they're, they're, they're yeah very easy to fly basically Wow at what point in this process of learning do you start to negotiate the, the thermals to get higher and higher or, or, or have I got that wrong? No, no. Um, once, once you start getting a bit more experience, um, you, you, we used to go and fly Mirtha a lot and that generally just was the wind coming from the, the west or southwest and you could saw the the, the the ridge and it's just a big ridge and then during the, the, the sort of the summer months then you get wafts of air coming up which are the thermals and and you could pick a thermal up and you start turning in that and, and you just try and stay in the the rising air if you fall it out out the rising air you go into the sinking air and you go down <laughs> um so it's, yeah, it's just gaining experience. The more you do it, the, the more experience you gain. Did you, um, is it possible to sort of really hit an air, a patch of cold air and, 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 and drop down like you can in an, in an aeroplane? Um, yes, basically. I did in Spain. Um, we were on a, an expert to Spain and I took off a, a site called Asia, um, up in the the northern end part of Spain, and it's a tricky takeoff, and it was about four thousand meters, four and a half thousand meters down to the landing field, and I made the error of taking off just before midday, and I was just going to have a, a sled ride down to the to the landing field before coming back up in the uh, late afternoon, where the whole valley four just lifts, and then you can just cruise around. I took off and just got hit by a thermal and it was a big one and I'd gained I don't know somewhere close on about 8,000 feet above the takeoff <laughs> and, well, there, there was nothing I could actually do to, to sort of find the down bit <laughs> so I, I was kicked around for a bit and then then finally I found found the stuff going down and it was it was quite a rapid descent but I was up for about, 
on an hour and a half trying to get down. It was it was <laughs> fairly uh, scary. Uh, by the time I got down to the landing field, I was freezing. <laughs> I'd only taken off in a t-shirt. <laughs> that is some height. I mean, when you when you skydive, you generally go from about twelve thousand feet, and that that is high. Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, no, it, jump jump from fifteen as well. Where we technically supposed to use oxygen at that height, but we 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 didn't. Um, yeah, that is just so frightening. Yeah, it was it, it was it was a moment. <laughs> uh, I think the the, the the most difficult part was that uh, it was a cold. I, so I just got a t shirt on, and and it was it was getting bloody chilly up there, and, and trying to find enough down. Um, every time I I sort of drop a thousand or a couple of thousand feet, I'll get hit by another one coming up. And, and just getting thrown around all over the place, and it was yeah, it was it was a challenge that, that particular flight. Do they not have vents like you'd have, say, on a hot air balloon or? Um... No, it's a wing. Yeah. It, it is. It is a wing. It's just. I just thought maybe in modern times they factored that in that that you could pull a lever and open a flap and you you you're going to lose a bit of lift. <laughs> If they not sort of invented well, one, well, well, you can always push the bar out and stall it, and what you end up doing then is is tail sliding, and then the nose will fall through, uh, and you recover. The drama comes if you do that too close to the ground; you don't recover in time. Stalling <laughs> was just we, when you we, when you. <laughs> when you do your private pilot's license, you've got to stall the plane and it's, you've just got to get it to the point. All the alarms come on the stall alarms wah, like that. And you're literally pulling back on the stick. And just as the plane starts to slide, you've got to shove the stick <laughs> forward. I think you give it left rudder or some, some, something or, um, well, it's pretty much the same with the hang glider. That's part of the 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 pilot license test is that you have to stall it. Um, and one incident, we had some paras on the course, and they were absolute nightmare, absolute nightmare, nutters, absolute nutters. And <laughs> the day they were doing that is this, this guy, he, he took off and then he pushed it straight into almost an immediate stall <laughs> and crashed into the side of the hill. <laughs> Yeah, don't send the paras up there with with baton guns. They'd they'd all be shooting oh. each other out the sky, wouldn't they? Oh, it was it was so funny. <laughs> Fortunately, I mean, he he bounced off of the the <laughs> the bar and and bent it. Um, but yeah, we didn't give him his license. <laughs> did, did you have any bad crashes? Um, I had a couple of rough landings. Um, is that the yeah, got, is that? Is that the euphemistic way of putting it, is it? <laughs> yeah. I didn't actually do any real damage, um, but, yeah, I, I got pancaked once flying um, a, a site called Bring Cows. Mm. Um, I just, as I was coming into land, I just hit a gust that took me down um, and I got slammed into the deck, which hurt. Mm. But other than that, no. No. Um, Generally, I, I managed to get away with most of the landings. Tim, before we come on, before we come on and talk about your welfare office a bit, and we're going to cover mental health there as well, aren't we? Yeah. Um, let can we just go back to the intelligence stuff because um, we didn't. Well, I wouldn't say we skimmed across it, did we? We did talk quite in depth, but I think people would just be interested to hear <clears throat> some of the. Um, it was quite interesting what we're saying about how they get involved in social media now and all this sort of stuff. Hmm. Um, is that the 77 brigade or is. Yeah, I'm not quite sure exactly the, the way that they operate, but certainly at 15 Psyops Group, uh, we run a course. And, and the basic Psyops course basically takes you through the whole process from planning. Uh, a campaign to doing the target audience analysis. So you look in depth at the target audience that you're trying to influence 
trying to find their vulnerabilities and their um, a, a way of of influencing them, basically. Then, then you're looking at product planning. Um, we use a, a worksheet called a PAW, which is a product action worksheet. And on this is, is you get all the information you need. So you look at what the aim is, what the mission wants to achieve, look at the target audience analysis, looking at the vulnerabilities, what influences the target audience, um, and then what type of product that you want to produce from it, from, from, from all of this, whether it's a, a print product, whether it's a radio product, whether it's a TV product, whether it's something going out on the, uh, the internet, on, on a radio, we, on the radio thing was we had a, a, a first in Macedonia. Um, have you seen the old RDS radios with which comes up with what station it is? Yes. In the UK, it's static. It, it just tells you what station it is or, or what's playing at that time. In Macedonia, you can have it scrolling. So we had a message go out and it said, NATO, the mission continues. Um, so that was just letting the, the population know that the mission that, of gathering up the weapons from the, uh, the NLA was continuing. What's that acronym? NLA? Yeah. Um, National Liberation Army. Okay. For, for Albania, basically. Um, and they, they wanted the Albanian language recognised in Macedonia, which is Greece. Um, so then, it, then the poor comes down to the um, product designers. So they'll design a product, um, whether it be print, radio script, or a TV script, and then that go back up for approval. And once it's been approved, because it has to go through a, an approval process, it has to go through um, legal, political and the commander, once it gets approved, then it comes down, it gets produced. Once it's produced, then it's it's disseminated. And then the, the, the real, the hardest part, of the whole process is measure of effect. Because you, it's so difficult to get to some of the target audiences, it's trying to get that measure of effect, whether the product has worked or not. And, and that's the, the the real tough bit. That's the bit that lots and lots of commanders just don't get. When they fire a, a missile and it explodes something to bits, you can see the effect. Psychological operations is a long-term weapon system. And it is a weapon system. But it takes time for that um, weapon system to take effect on the target audience. And that's the bit that we need to get across to commanders. And I think we're, we're, we're kind of getting there nowadays. There's lots and lots of commanders get it. We used to support the, um, I forget what the, the exercise we called it, but the staff college, there's, they have a, a planning exercise and the group used to go down there and support that exercise with PSYOPs um, products and and briefings and stuff like that and we used to go out um, on our pre-deployment training the team would go out and they would brief up the commanders on on what we can provide for that brigade that we were attached to and I did JMC the joint maritime course I thought it was just like uh, staff college no Joint Maritime Course, they call it Joint Warrior now, I think. Um, it's, it's like we had three carrier groups on this particular one. We had two American and um, Busty, all coming up either side of the UK and converging on the, the Hebrides and a big punch up in the Hebrides. And that was, that was actually interesting because um, I, was, I was up there the first week we were going to be in the Maritime Ops Room or just off, off the, the Maritime Ops Room. 
and the second week we were due to go out on ocean to see if we could operate off of ocean. Well, at, at that time, Macedonia was kicking off. And over the weekend, where we should have been transferring over to ocean, we were recalled down to Chicksands to get ready to deploy to Macedonia for this task force harvest. And while we were on task force harvest, 9-11 happened. And I, I found myself in, in sort of February 2002 in Kabul. That was <laughs> that was scary. I was I was flying into Kabul, and when, at that time, they do a tactical night landing, where they switch off all the lights on the aircraft, and they fry it around, and they stick it on the ground. <laughs> I've been flying around in the air. I'm thinking, what the hell have I got myself into this time? <laughs> and we we got we came off the back of the this. Um, C-130, we were led off in really sort of dim light into this tent uh, and we were given a brief about all the nasty things that can happen to you there. Oh, and by the way, don't step off the hard standing because they haven't cleared all the mines yet. You're thinking, oh, Christ. Yeah, so for, for me, I just, it, it was an opportunity yeah. uh, to do something different, to to experience different stuff and, and and do stuff that i was enjoying i mean i i absolutely loved what i was doing in psyops i was i was um i was training people up on the the different medias i mean with my print background i was te teaching people how to to put a print product together we were using stuff like photoshop in design to do that mm -hmm. i was working on the radio side teaching people how to to be radio presenters or how to how to teach other people to present because you weren't going to be a presenter yourself you was going to be the producer so you had to teach somebody with a different language to be a presenter and so and how to put a product together how to put a, a radio show together using radio wheels how to insert your um your ads your messages, how to put the news in, where to put the music, how how to break the, the programs down. So I was doing all of that sort of stuff. Plus on the, uh, we run a pre-deployment package that started six months out from when people were going to deploy. So we'll, we'll form a team, we'll bring the team together and we'll start with the low level stuff. Uh, the first, first few weeks was bring their, all their military skills up to date get the weapon handling down to, to an acceptable level, take them down to the ranges for, for a week, um, firing all their weapons handling um, tests. So they would start off on the pistols, and we went from the, the nine mil to the Glock, then the rifle, then the minigun, then the GPMG, and on odd occasions, we could get hold of a, the ULG, the, the underslung, grenade launcher thing we had them a couple of times and a couple of times we managed to get out of a couple of five o's so people had the opportunity to fire some big stuff mm -hmm. were you ever uh, worried somebody you were training would, would turn around and use the weapons on you no not at all we did lose one person um that i trained that really really hit the group really hard and that was i don't you remember sarah bryant she was the first female to be killed in Afghanistan. Um, I trained her up to go out. She was a, a cracking lass, real gutsy, um, did everything that we asked her to do. She was, she was good on all the weapons. She was out. She was going to um, on a patrol with some um, SAS guys across into Natalie, and their convoy was hit with an IED, and she was blown up and killed. And that, that had a, a big effect on the whole group, losing one of our own. Um, yeah, that, that, that took the group a long time to get over. So talking of mental health then, let's um, come forward to when you were... So did, did you say to me on the phone, you, or, you, were, a, or you were a welfare officer for the guards? 
Yes. Um, when at the end of my deployment in 2009 with 3 Commando Brigade, I learned uh, a while beforehand that I wasn't going to be able to get, because my contract was coming up for renewal because I was on a FTRS full commitment. Um, and the group didn't have a post to put me in because they'd been recruiting heavily off the back of all of our success. People wanted to come to the group. Um, so they'd recruited regulars and, and some more reserve and there wasn't a, a, a pit for me. So I had to start looking around for something else. And this particular job came up as a, as a unit welfare officer for one of the incremental companies. So I came back on R&R, &R, went down to London, had an interview and got accepted for the post. So when I came back for my um, my contract ended and uh, I started this new contract on the 1st of September in 2009 as a, a welfare officer for Nijmegen Company Grenadier Guards. Wow, did you... It sounds like you didn't have any experience of that before. Did you have to go on, on training courses to be able to do this or was it more of an admin sort of position? Um, no. Uh, well, I, when I came back, I, I came back in, I think it was about the, it was June, no, May. Came back from Afghanistan in May and I'd already booked onto the unit welfare officers course, which was a two week course at that time up at Bristol University. Um, so I went up there after my leave. I did the, the welfare course, which was, which is just a basic grounding. And when I actually started the job, I had a, a clean sheet of paper. They hadn't had a, a welfare officer in that particular role. Um, so I had to make up the job as I went along. And I took a huge amount of liberties, huge amount of liberties. Can you give us an example? Um, well, because it, I wasn't particularly busy to start with. I mean, the job got horrendously busy at the end. But to start with, it was just trying to gain the, the, the guy's trust uh, so they'd come to you. And to do that, I used, used a few different methods. I set up a rugby team for the incremental companies. So we, we got three companies together and we played rugby on a, a Wednesday afternoon and I got a team together. All the, the company commanders agreed to it. Uh, so we got this team together. Guys playing rugby on a Wednesday. Our first real game, uh, it took them up to Caterham where I lived and I used to, I was playing for the old Cats at the time, the old Caterhamians. So we had a big, big day because Caterham used to be a guards depot. We, we put out big posters and everything like that, saying that the guards are returning to Caterham for, for one day only to play rugby against the old cats. And we made a big day of it. We got RBL down. We've got health heroes down. We've got loads of stalls from, from the local rotary clubs and that. Um, so we made a big, big day of it. And we, and we had a game of rugby. And then we went into the league uh into the minor units league in the south and we were playing uh, the engineers and bits of pieces like that and then one day uh, we'd be we've been playing for about a couple of years um we came up against two rrf um team fiji which was our downfall really um the following day after this this game nine blokes decided they're going to take themselves down the med center uh, to get out of a guard or something like that, which I do. Uh, and the next thing, I got a phone call from the garrison commander saying, come to my office. And um, he pulled the plug on the rugby team. Mm -hmm. um, I also got the guys into um, a few guys that we took to the Telemark Championships. I'm a big Telemark skier myself, uh, and I've been taking part in the, the Telemark Championships. Have you skied with any Marines? Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about more... lots, lots of mates. Yeah, have you skied with Trig? Yeah, I know Trig. Yeah, Frank, Frankie, Frankie's a really good mate of mine. 
Okay, I don't know him. Trig and I, we joined up. We were in the same troop in training together. All right. Yeah, he's uh, yeah ma major now. Yeah. Do you know the uh, the Davis brothers? No, not I'm I'm, right. I'm quite unfamiliar with it all. Really, I, I it's a bit strange that I never really um, I never really thought about the Marines for like twenty years of my or probably fifteen years of my life. I didn't really see Marines. I I, I think I met two in that fifteen years, right? And then what happened is Facebook came around. And people started to add me as a friend that I was, I'd, I'd be honest, I'd forgotten a lot of them. It was like, oh my God, yeah, yeah, we worked at, we were at that draft to get, yeah, 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 got it, got it. So I'm adding all these people and a, a lot of them lived in my home city. We're talking, you know, a good, a good 20 of them. And I'm a bit of a, I'm anti hard men doing sissy little boy stuff. I don't know if you're allowed to use the word sissy anymore, but I'm going to use it anyway, right? <laughs> so I've got these grown, big, rough, tough commanders poking me on Facebook, whatever the hell that was spo supposed to mean. Poking me, <laughs> right? And I know I'm not going to poke you back, sorry. Um, so what I did, Tim, is I, I, I organised... Uh, like a run ashore, right? And I start this little Facebook group and I added these 20 blokes. And I'm like, come on, fellas, let's go for a beer like the old days. Let's stop poking each other on Facebook, right? <laughs> and um, when I woke up the next day, because I'd left the I'd left the invite open on this group, there's like 1,700 people in the group. <laughs> <laughs> so I accidentally... started off the first like actual official Royal Marines reunion and it just it so I what I'm trying to say is I got back into the my, the like military circle that way it was just pure mm. like happenstance really I, I I didn't really think about the military that much for like I say I just was off traveling and studying at uni and all this kind of stuff um so when you ask me, do I know sons or do I not know? I, 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 no, right. I, 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 I'm getting back to knowing a few more people now, but I'm still not, I'm not really like in that massively in that circle. Well, I, I, I only had a, a short break of about um, six years where I was on regular reserve. So I kind of didn't fall out of it at all. Um, and I was able to transfer back to being a Royal Anglian uh, in 2003, um, I'd gone off on a, a promotion course down to Blanford as when I was Royal Signals. And um, at the end of this course, on the wash up, there was a female warrant officer uh, asked me why I was there taking up a place for somebody from a signals unit when I wasn't in a signals unit. Well, I took umbrage of that. I thought, I've been in the signals. I'm, I'm, I'm now in a, a an independent unit, and they don't want me. So I got back after that weekend, and I was pretty steaming. I, I thought, sod the raw signals. They don't like me. I'll um I rang up my regiment headquarters, who at that time the regimental secretary was an old platoon commander of mine, really good mate, and I said can I come back to the regiment? And he said, no problem at all. So we, we sorted out the paperwork with Glasgow and I transferred back to being a Royal Anglian. And that's how I finished up um, my career as a, a colour sergeant, Royal Anglian with the guards. When you were the welfare officer, did you have to break bereavement news to, 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 to people? Yeah. I was... Um, because of the job we were doing, we we went and did all the different courses up at the um, the chaplain's department. Um, what's the name of the place? 
Doesn't we're all done. I can't, I can't think of the name of the place now. It'll come to me in a minute. Um, but I did the visit officers course. I did the notification officers course. Uh, a few other courses up at um, and Port House, which is just down from Andover. Mm. So I was qualified to do it. And then because of the nature of the beast, lots of people coming back from sort of 2009 onwards from Afghanistan. I went out and did notification officer a couple of times with an officer. Um, we, we did a rotor in London district. And then I did my first visiting officer. And that was a, that was a little bit of a nightmare because there, there was a big incident in Afghanistan at the time that involved the guards. There was, there was a couple of deaths in there and I got one of the guys that was on the team that got shot and I had his family and I, I, I picked the family up. I took them up to um, Selly Oak and walking around the hospital waiting to, because the guy was in ICU and all the rest of it, waiting for them to, to go and see the husband. The press was all over the place, the, and 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 the press uh, were a real pain in the ass, put it bluntly, um, and it was quite difficult to evade them, and we did. Um, we just we just took ourselves off somewhere else until we got the call, and, and she was able to go in to see her husband. He survived, by the way. Um, but I worked with that family for the best part of, I don't know six, seven months before I was able to hand them over to their welfare officer, uh, where, the, where the battalion was able to take over. But that took me away a lot of time from what my job was, looking after the 100 guys that we had in the company. So doing, doing visiting officer is, I, I, I think, should be a full-time role for... Um, reserves um, to be able to be stood up to do the job for for, for however, how long it takes God, it to look must, after a family. Must, it's difficult. It's tough. Must take its toll, isn't it? It's a bit like being an mm. undertaker or something. It's just that that you know, or a police when you're working on the sex crimes unit. It's just that constant, yeah, dealing with a part of life that you shouldn't really deal with in in that bigger quantity. Yeah, I also had a um, had to deal with a death. Now, it, it what had happened was this 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 guy he, he worked he lived in he lived in Windsor, and he worked in um, anyway he had to ride across Windsor Great Park to get to work, and he was a keen cyclist. And he had uh, one of these all singing, all dancing carbon fibre bikes you can lift up with your little finger that, that goes like stink. He had overtaken a couple of other cyclists in the park and he was, he, I mean, he was, he was motoring. A squirrel had run out and gone straight into his front wheel and disintegrated the bike when, when the I mean, the front wheel disintegrated, the bike smashed into a, a, a thousand pieces. He'd come off, fortunately he had a helmet on it, he knocked himself clean out. He was taken off to the Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. They couldn't find the family of the squirrel, unfortunately. But I had his wife and I took her to, to the Radcliffe to see him. He survived, by the way, the squirrel didn't. <laughs> it took him a long time to live that down. <laughs> He's a squirrel murderer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but him and it, uh, his his wife and I had a really good laugh about it when when when, when it all started to come out properly. <laughs> And, and, and I don't think the regiment's quite um, gotten over him. Or he, no. he hasn't been lived it down yet. 
They didn't um, adopt the squirrel as their mascot, did they? I don't know. <laughs> but they, they would squirrel claret and fur everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> hey i tell you what you know those bloody bikes are expensive i should know i got one in the garage mm. um yes taken out by a squirrel tim w your own mental health i'm i'm guessing that's taking a bit of a bashing at times how how how's it affected you in your experiences and and how have you over or how do you deal with them I should say um well fortunately I was I mean 2005 2006 was really really tough years um and I, I still struggle with November but during some some of the training that we had uh, as a welfare officer I've done the, the mental health first aid course. I'm a, I was a trim practitioner and coordinator. And to that end, I mean, can kind of look after myself somewhat. And I saw trim in, uh, in 2000, 2008-9 in Afghanistan firsthand, seeing how it was working actually what, on the ground. What is, what is trim, Tim? Trim is trauma incident, incident management, and it's just a, a process to take people through to help them cope with what they've seen. And, and I've got a few incidents of, of, of seeing this firsthand. In Afghanistan, um, I was travelling around and I was in one of the fobs that had a, an incident um, where a few guys had, had been killed. And I was, I was actually stuck there for a few days while I was setting up one of these radios. And the trim, trim team came in and they, I was sharing a, um, a cabin with, with one of the guys on the team and we were talking about what he was there doing and, and what it was all about. And then when I, um, when I got back and started doing the welfare stuff, I did the, the trim course to be able to become a, a coordinator. And we had a, a, an incident in London um, where some guys was out on a run. One of the guys actually collapsed outside of Knightsbridge Barracks, fortunately, that just happened to have a paramedic ambulance there at the time. Um, but it was quite traumatic for the guy, seeing this guy and the way he was, he, he, he'd gone down and they managed to get him across. They got him resuscitated on and, and one thing and another. Um, and after this incident, the, the garrison commander decided it would be a good idea because we'd just, I'd, I'd just organised having some training uh, about three or four weeks beforehand. There would be a good opportunity to put this into practice firsthand. So we, we, we called together a, a team from across the garrison we got everybody that was involved. We did the, the planning cycle for it, worked out who needed to see what, who was going to get just an overall brief, who needed a little bit more, who needed a one-to-one -to, -one to talk through their emotions and what they'd seen and how to, to cope with the incident. So basically 72 hours after a traumatic incident witnessed, you sit people down, you talk to them and you tell them that it's normal to feel that the way they're feeling about the incident and then you do a follow-up about four weeks later and then you do a further follow-up three months later and if anything's changed if they're not coping with it particularly well then you can signpost them on to professional help so this is this is just giving them that first aid to cope with what they've seen the problem comes on the operational front is where you've got guys in conflict day in day out how do you trim them off for that uh, and i think that's one of the things that the marines do particularly well what do the can you give an example of what how the marines would de deal with it so if there's a, a fatality it's not very pretty then, then they, get, they, they go through that same process 
but they've been doing it for a lot longer than the, than the army. The army is now taking it on board and seeing that it, it does help people in the long term. And this this is a long term assistance. It's it's not it's not a quick fix. It's just letting people know that it's okay not to be okay, basically. Yeah. And that the, the feelings that they're going through, what they've seen, it, yes, it's traumatic. However, it's it's normal to have those emotions. It's normal to feel that way. And it's okay to talk about it. And that's the, the, the key to it all, is to be able to talk about it without re-traumatising someone. And that's, that's the difficult bit, is not re-traumatising. Yes. Yes, this is the issue with talk therapy, isn't it? Is mm. You can just be rehashing the very thing that your mind's trying to distance itself from. Um, yeah. That's uh, probably a conversation for another day. I've had that conversation with a couple of people on the podcast, and it's it's fascinating. Sean Grant, um, he wrote a book called Attack Panic, and he's got mm. some incredibly forward-thinking strategies about how how you, how you deal with um, and you balance trauma. Um, yes, I was I was just thinking in a combat situation it must be difficult because you're out on one patrol, something absolutely catastrophic can happen. You come back to camp, you have a sandwich and, and, and you're off out, you know, you're off out again. Right. There isn't, yeah. there isn't really that time to be signposting people to, to therapists and, um, or support support groups or, or even, I suppose then you have to talk, do you promote talking to your team then and, you, and, and your, your, yeah, your I, th I think, I think in the first incidence is, is, is the guys that are involved in it sit down and just ch talk about it, talk about what happened. And, and it's just getting people to open up to how they feel in themselves in, in the whole issue and, and, and to keep it there. So, so although they're not re traumatizing each other, but they're helping each other through it. And it's normal. It's a normal process to go through. It's like bereavement. Bereavement affects different people in different ways. But it's all normal feelings that people are going through. It's all, it's, it's not unusual to, to, to have those feelings. Mm. And, that's, that, and that's the key message to put across, that they're not alone in it and, and people are there to help. Yes, and that's that's the best best that it could do is 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 to be there for somebody. Mm. So that's trim trim explained. But we were talking about your situation, Tim, weren't we? Um, when did this sort of thing all all catch catch you up? I think I, I did the, the welfare officer job for eight years uh, in total, and when you. When you're actually in there doing the job, it's just fine. You, 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 you're dealing with other people's shit day in, day out. And 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 it varies. I mean, people come with all sorts of problems. I mean, London Central Garrison or London District is, is, a, is a, 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 a strange beast. There's no other beast like it in, in the military. You've got the headquarters element where you've got senior officers um you've got all the, the the top brass for london basically and and it's and then you've got the incremental companies so you've got three companies of foot guards of young lads and and they come straight out the factory and this is their their phase three training for want of another word this is teaching guards to do what guards do, which is uh, standing in a tunic and looking smart and in the public eye. Then you've got the, the foot guards bands and you've got the, the, the five foot guards bands that we had. And they tend to be slightly more senior soldiers, but they come with their own sets of issues 
they they are more your lovey types rather than your roughy tufty sort of getting in with a bayonet types. So so they they're a little bit more what's the word to use? Bit tactile, is that a good word? Yeah, it, yeah they, they they tend to be a little bit more sensitive. Yeah. So so the issues that they have tend to be different. So so a young lad will will, will come out of training, um, be in London for the first time, got a thousand pound um, disposable beer tokens, and he'll go and do that in a weekend, and then he's struggling for the rest of the month, um, <laughs> wanting hungry hungry soldier chits and one thing and another. Um, with the bands, you might get somebody that's um, that's going through a breakup of a relationship that, that they're finding really, really tough. And then again, you get a senior officer that's that's having some problems, and we've I've dealt with a couple of those. So you get all of this stuff. And then you've got housing issues on top of it. And I don't know whether you've seen the, the housing, the quality of the housing in, in central London. You've got a couple of blocks of flats that they don't really spend a huge amount of money on. Then you've got the accommodation in Wellington Barracks itself. Um, yeah. So you've got those issues to deal with, people complaining about. Uh, complaints about this, that, and the other. So all that, all that, day in, day out, does take an effect. And when it stops, was uh, I found a problem. I, I, I retired. I actually retired on the 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 fifth of April, twenty eighteen, from from service when I was sixty. I'd actually finished. Back in the um, the October, I ended up going in the hospital, but I put my back out, uh, and I was in absolute clip with it, and I didn't end up going back to work. But I guess it, it started for me catching up slightly. I was I was getting emotional over stupid little things. I sit and watch the telly, and, and there'll be a cartoon, and they have a sad ending, and I'm sat there in bloody tears thinking what the hell's going on um so thinking back to the, the mental health first aid courses that i've done i sort of put it into some sort of perspective i went to see the doctor had a chat with him he referred me on to um the the, the, the local mental health people had a chat with them got it kind of sorted out didn't want to go too much into the military stuff that I've seen, I mean, there's some real horrors that I've got buried back there. I'd just leave them there. Um, but it's this, this emotional stuff is, is just easy to deal with. He's just thinking, why are you doing that? It's really sort um, But it's just, just all those, those little things that, that sort of pile up. And it's just sort of sat down, chat to the wife and, and we've got it sorted out, and now I'm, I'm almost fine. Yeah. Did you find you were hitting the hit hit hitting hitting the beers or? or... Um. Since well, always like the the odd G and T uh, and and rum. Um, we go sailing. I'm a sailor. We've got our own boat, and you always have a drink when you get in. But during lockdown. Um, yeah, I could probably stick away a bottle of rum a week. I've I'd, I'd now sort myself out. I'll just do it on a Thursday. We call it Thursday Thursday, and occasionally I'll go on Facebook and have a bit of a rant uh, and, and go do a little bit of fishing, see if I can put a bite on somebody and see if I get a, yeah, one or two people bite back. Normally, normally over political issues. Mm. But that's just for a bit of fun. So, yeah, I, I try and limit my drinking just to a Thursday. Uh, and I'll probably drink, I don't know, quarter, half a bottle of rum. 
Yeah, that old rum. Cool. <laughs> I wouldn't know anything about that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to drink half a bottle by the time most people were getting out of bed. <laughs> yes, you start my you writing should... early and um, hit the rum early and mm. it's just easily done. The problem is so easily done very easy to justify and it's it's all well and good when you're not seeing the damage it's doing to your internal organs yeah but then all that can just bang hit you in a wonner and suddenly you, those organs can start failing failing and this is when it becomes problematic because by that time you're so bloody addicted to the rum that you still want to drink the damn stuff um yeah it's, it's a bit like chocolate so if she puts chocolate in a cupboard, it don't stay in a cupboard. Yeah, long. <laughs> oh, I'm, 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 I'm yeah. So a Kit Kat's got more breaking strain than I've got. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but at least you recognise it. I think it, this, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty that's, much the same. That's, 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 that's the key, is to, is to realise what's going on with yourself. Yeah. And it's knowing yourself. And, and, I, and I've kind of, I've, I'm there now with it. So I'm, I'm coping great. Yeah, it's and self talk is really powerful. I mean, I I don't have alcohol in the house simply because I just bloody go and drink. You know, mm. there, there'll always be a time where it seems appropriate to suddenly go and down that bottle of wine you were given for Christmas for, <laughs> at some inappropriate time. Um, so I don't really have alcohol in 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 the house. Um, if I'm in a situation where it's a, it's around and I don't want to drink, I just brainwash myself with, I think about tomorrow. I think, I think of that lovely feeling waking up without a hangover. You can't beat it. It's great. And then I think uh, of that waking up with a hangover, your day is ruined. You feel awful. Every, nothing makes sense anymore. You don't get your work done. You, you just punishing yourself. And that's enough for me now to go, Oh, I won't bother doing that then. <laughs> most so, of the time I, I that's where i have a problem because i inherited the ability to drink from my old man and he never had a hangover in the morning and i don't get one and it's just i can i can kind of function normally on a <laughs> having had a, a fair bit to drink the night before yeah but, yeah it's, i i found when i drank regularly i was like that you didn't get a hangover because i suppose technically you were still drunk in the morning and <laughs> what I'd get instead is like a three o'clock craving where it's just, wow, I need some more alcohol now. And then back, that's that evening <laughs> taken care of. Um, I think when you lay off it for, for months and months, I mean, I lay off it for years at a time now. And then when you have a drink, Oh my God, then I get a hangover, <laughs> the hangover <laughs> from, from hell. Tim, before, before we go, please give your podcast a mention and, and let us know what it's about. Okay, I did a podcast. It's called the Tim Hill Podcast. It's available on all the main platforms. So um, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, Deezer, Google. So it's all out there. So you just put a, a search for the Tim Hill Podcast. The first 24 episodes are all about me. It's all about my life, what I went through growing up, my military history, and what I've done with my life. The series two is a little bit more in detail of some of the other stuff that I've done. And my latest series, series three, is all about other people. I've gone with ordinary people and their extraordinary stories. I've had a, a submarine commander or a submarine technician who was in charge of all the nuclear warheads out at sea. I've got uh, a police officer who was in the Met Police Firearms Unit and the way he operated. I've got some fascinating people. So please, if you've got the time, have a tune in to the Tim Hill podcast. Wow, Tim, you've been absolutely excellent. Thank you so much for coming on the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. I think you're, as I said, you're our first guest that's enlightened or been able to enlighten us as, as to what, um, what some of these organisations do. 
Mm. Um, and so, yes, thank you for that. Maybe we'll do a live show together one Friday and um, we'll let the subscribers on YouTube ask you. Yeah. Pick your brains over a, over a few things. But uh, yeah, hopefully I haven't given away any tr um, state secrets. Wow. <laughs> wouldn't be the worst thing in in in, in the world because uh states run by sociopaths and we hmm. <laughs> we shouldn't be defending them um yes okay so colors once again thank you very much just just stay on the line tim so i can thank you properly to everybody at home hope you find that as fascinating as i have much love to you all look after each other if you could like and subscribe um, we'll get you more of this great content. Thank you.